Hello and welcome to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. I'm your host, Paul Kraus, licensed professional counselor. In today's episode, I'm going to be speaking with Dr. Peg O'Connor, her second time on the show. And we're going to be talking about the concept of the essential arts of personhood and also how those essential arts of personhood are impacted by trauma. We're also going to be talking about trauma-informed theory. Dr. Peg O'Connor is a powerhouse. You are going to love her. She is so interesting. She has so much experience. She is a professor of philosophy at Gustavus Adolphus College in St. Peter, Minnesota. She writes on her website that she is a recovering alcoholic of 35 years and the author of Higher and Friendly Powers, Transforming Addiction and Suffering, and Life on the Rocks, Finding Meaning in Addiction and Recovery. She writes a really cool column for Psychology Today called Philosophy, Stirred, Not Shaken. In her free time, she's a tennis player, a black belt in Taekwondo, and has worked in a dog rescue for 10 years and finds that her faith in humanity can simultaneously be shattered by meeting mistreated animals and restored by colleagues who are fiercely loving and caring advocates. All right, let's get to the interview. I'd like to welcome Dr. Peg O'Connor back to the Intentional Clinician Podcast. Thanks for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me back, Paul. I really appreciate the opportunity to get get to talk to you again. Absolutely. I know a lot of people enjoyed our first episode. There will be a link in the show notes if they want to check in on that, which uh, was related to your book that came out recently. Um, And in this episode, though, we've decided to pivot a little bit and talk about trauma and something that uh, you were talking to me about called the essential arts, sorry, the essential arts of personhood. Um. (laughs) Yeah. So let's head into that. Where where should we start? Uh, Why don't we start with that expression, the essential essential arts of personhood. I apologize. I've been teaching all day, so I've just been blah, 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 blah. So I'll need to slow my roll here. So the essential arts of personhood is a concept that comes from a feminist philosopher named Annette Beyer. And she was interested in the way that we all begin our lives and live our lives as second persons. So we get so used to talking about first person, the I statements, and third persons, the he, she, or they statements. But we don't pay attention to the fact that we are all second persons to other particular people, that we all are related to some people who came before us. We will be related to people who come after us. We are related to our friends. And in the nexus of those kinds of relationships that human beings develop what she calls essential, meaning necessary, arts, meaning abilities, not just cognitive abilities, but abilities about being in the world in certain kinds of ways, of being a person, of being recognized as a person and taking yourself as a person. And in moral philosophy, person or personhood isn't just descriptive, it's prescriptive. So it's a normative term. To be regarded as a person is to be regarded as a kind of being that has a certain moral standing and that perhaps has innate dignity or innate worth that should be respected in a kind of way just because you are a person. So Annette Beyer includes in the essential arts of personhood all the ones that we would typically think about. It's the ability to think. It's the ability to deliberate. It's the ability to compare. It's the ability to contrast. It's the ability to augment something or shrink something as you're thinking about it. It's all those what we might call critical thinking skills plus. But she also talks about it's a set of skills that enable us to navigate the social world and the moral world and the political physical worlds And I'm intrigued by the ways that certain essential arts of personhood go together quite importantly, and that make us be full-blown moral agents, that we can participate in the moral community. And I'm concerned by the way in which trauma hinders the development of those particular arts. So I know that developmental psychologists, I know that Bessel van der Kolk, that fantastic, famous psychiatrist who has worked a lot with PTSD 
has offered an alternative diagnosis for children or for adults who suffered trauma as a child called developmental trauma disorder, that psychologists are always looking at most often cognitive development and social development. And I, as a moral philosopher, want to look at moral development. And that doesn't get as much attention. So I'm launching this project, whatever it may be, I don't know. But I'm looking at a constellation of what I identify as belonging as those essential arts of personhood. Imagining, hoping, having empathy, maintaining bodily dominion, and having or exercising self-possession. And that those are essential arts to becoming a moral agent, to becoming a fully valued and valuing moral person in the world. And my concern is that with so much trauma happening, in particular to young children, that they aren't acquiring those arts because many of those arts are formed in the context of stable families or stable school communities. But we have so much radical insecurity now with housing, with poverty, with what's happening with public schools, that children are not acquiring these arts. And I think it's a moral crisis. I think that trauma, childhood trauma is a moral crisis. And the slice of it that I wanna look at is what are the repercussions? What are the effects downstream of hundreds of thousands of children not learning how to do certain things that are important to being regarded as a person? Oh, goodness. Yes. I think oh, goodness. <laughs> we are only starting to see the effects of this. Mm -hmm. um, but I think along with radical insecurity, like you discussed, uh, according to, I don't want to misquote him, but Dr. Bruce Perry's book, uh, work on the neurosequential model, a lot of uh, food insecurity and housing insecurity and these sort of things can be linked to um, crime and abuse and other things like this that children get into, whether they're being abused or maybe abusing a friend or whatever, there's a lot of, the roots are coming from not having Maslow's hierarchy met and then not having a place to go to school uh, that feels safe or not having a parent or two that has emotional coping skills. Um, oftentimes, according to some of the lectures I've seen, those kids end up being quote unquote problem children Yes. And they get labeled as a problem child to get put on medications. And usually they end up incarcerated at some point in their life or costing the system money versus, you know, a child who is able to develop this coping skills, who has more, uh, even if they're from a difficult place where they don't have all their needs being met, being met with empathy and compassion in a specialized plan can learn these skills, but they may be delayed. Yes. Uh, delayed skills. Um, and I think that if anything right now, I would say from my anecdotal experience in psychology, we are at least seeing a lot of delayed skills right now. Not, uh, mm -hmm. it, not, it, and of course, you know, in the public system where I used to work, the depravity of all of these skills, imagining, hoping, having empathy, bodily dominion, and self-possession. I, The children I worked with that were in the public system had no idea about any of that stuff. And they basically would, uh, you know, do whatever they could to be safe and follow whatever they could to feel like they were belonging. And that didn't necessarily mean that it was going to be something that would lead to long-term good outcomes. Oh, I think that's absolutely right. And we certainly know that children are sponges. They're constantly learning to good effect and to bad effect but they can't always make that distinction themselves. So what may be an, adapt, an adaptive strategy for dealing with something can become maladaptive if you don't learn other kinds of self-soothing mechanisms, coping mechanisms. How are you able to regulate your emotions? And all of these things are not innate. They're learned. But we're not you know, as a culture, we're not teaching them very well. And, you know, all the talk about parental scaffolding, you know, that a lot of this should be happening in the context of a nuclear family. Well, we can look at the numbers. We see nuclear families are uh, becoming in short supply 
And we might say even an intact nuclear family, there's no guarantee that that is a good, healthy family system anyway. So just because they have the correct number of parents and the correct sexes of parents, that that's going to guarantee a good in, a, a good outcome. So I, I know for me, my my heart is broken for these children. And as an educator, I worry about what will the future be like for them? You know, what is it like for me as a teacher now encountering students who much of their high school education was online um, in the context of the pandemic and the kinds of challenges I see in students of this generation that I maybe didn't see 10 or 15 years ago? You know, what's different? And, you know, for example, I have to remind myself that I am now teaching a generation of students where active shooter drills were part of regular school life and active shootings in schools has been a reality for all of my students now in a way that they those never were before and certainly very different from my experience you know as a kid you know the worry was that the soviet union was going to come and you know bomb us or drop a nuclear bomb of some sort and so i was supposed to cover you know cover myself under my desk or you know stop drop and roll so i am having students who have challenges, the likes of which I feel completely unprepared for. But I feel like where I can tack into these discussions is about how does this make them think about their moral character, who they are in the world, how they want to suit up and show up, and how do they see what I you know, self-identify as these essential arts of personhood, where they see them being developed or not. And I, I have so much to learn from them. But if we don't pay attention to the moral dimensions of this radical insecurity, of childhood trauma, of, you know, systemic racism and violence, it also raises important questions about what does a democracy look like when a significant percentage of its population has been traumatized and isn't fully able or willing to participate in the bread and butter of civic life. I mean, I think we're seeing a lot of people who have a kind of indifference to what's happening in the world and indifference maybe even to what's happening to themselves. And to me as a moral philosopher, I I find that so deeply unsettling and, and tragic and something that needs to be remedied. Yes. And, <clears throat> and this is a comment on that because I would say that while you're right that there may not be the ability to participate fully in this civic life and come to the come to a discussion table uh, that we're witnessing, I do believe one of the many culprits is time. Time, the way people spend time, is drastically different than 20 years ago when I was. Mm. Oh no, 23 years ago when I was 18. <laughs> oh, he's he's doing the math there. I'm okay, doing now math. We know how old um, he is. Yeah. So the the time has changed and it seems that a part of it is possibly due to technology, right? We 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 change our time. Uh part of it is due to availability of technology. Part of it is due to stagnant wages um and the lower and middle class socioeconomic uh, places. Part of it is due to complications of modern life that were not there. Okay. Yep. 23 years ago, I remember my life being a lot more simple and it wasn't just because I was young, but, uh, the, the technology demands were less, uh, technology addiction is a big thing. So there's so many headwinds with time, but I think time is part of this, which is time to reflect time to contemplate is a luxury. Now it is a luxury and it's what almost everybody wants. If you go on, I'm going a little rabbit trail here, but if you go on the internet and you read up on what's trending, right? Besides essential oils mm -hmm. and saging your house and cool muffins or whatever, there are these whole groups of people that are looking to try to minimize their hours of work by finding a passive income source, right? There was the whole four hour work week trend. That whole... what, can you explain what passive income is? I, I confess well, that that mystifies sure. me. Passive income is kind of a fantasy, which is why most people making passive income are selling the idea of passive income. But the idea of passive income would be like something like this. I own a vending machine company 
and it's at all the rest stops in the state. And I've and I've made enough money because I worked my butt off after work, uh, bringing chips and cookies and all this stuff to these mm-hmm. vending machines and renting the space. That eventually, I no longer work for a vending machine company. I hire some guy named Sam to go run around and do all this stuff for me. And he, I pay him a salary. I pay all the rent. I pay for all the cookies and chips, but mm-hmm. I make so much money that essentially my only job is about two or three hours a week of managing money. Okay. Oh, okay. And thus passive income is that you have minimized your amount of work you have to do in order to gain money. Some people have all sorts of different ideas, such as um, the trend of making your own course, a video course that's online that's perpetually there. And if you can sell enough, I mean, it's the same idea, you know, a movie uh, a actor takes two years of their life to make a movie. And then for the rest of their life, they get royalty checks or bands Mm -hmm. make money. So it's the same idea, but there's, it's, it's inflated into many different realms, including I've even heard recently, I heard this weekend, somebody explained to me that you could rent an apartment in certain complexes in luxurious areas and run an Airbnb out of that apartment. If it has the right rules and you're paying a two thousand dollar lease, but because you've furnished it with luxury items, you're getting probably three to four thousand dollars above your rent. So it's this idea that everybody wants more money because there's not enough money to go around the social, uh, the mm-hmm. middle and lower classes. And if time's a luxury, when do I have time to imagine, quote, um, have things to think about? And thus, when do I have time to learn about myself? When do I have time to actually learn about civic discourse and even go to these school board meetings or go to the government meetings or write my senators or get involved in court meetings? Mm-hmm. What, where's my time for that? It's been sucked up by some of my own things that I've done, but also just the way that money and time is money is my own my old, uh, old uh, economic teacher used to say, some of the way that time and money and hours of working have been restructured in our society, some willingly and some unwilling, right? So I think about that, what you're talking about, and it's the speeding up of things, partly from technology, but then I think about with kids, you know, they need that quiet, soft touch, you know, that quiet, mm-hmm. not touch, but, you know, that that metaphorically, uh, quiet, soft classroom to learn, yet, and also that challenge they need, right? So if they're not getting that and they're always on edge, like I have to study for the next test or whatever, I can see the stress levels. And if you have stress, it's hard to think um, in your right. um, in that part of your mind that is responsible for cognitive function. The frontal, you know, the, the prefrontal cortex goes offline with stress. And if prefrontal cortex goes offline with stress, then we have more reactionary stuff. We have more violence. We have people believing the most wacky conspiracy theories you've ever heard in your life as if it was some sort of uh, truth handed down uh, from, you know, a judge. So essentially, uh, we've got a a confluence of factors here, which are making it difficult for people to have the essential arts of personhood and simultaneously traumatizing the nervous systems. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing this macro effect across the society of no one has time. Everybody wants passive income. Nobody has, you know, we have the luxury of a nice smartphone, but we don't have the time to read a book, right. And, and to relax our bodies. Yeah. I mean, I, I do think that there is a certain busyness to living that you've identified and that a lot of it is self-imposed. And I was reading an article, I don't know, last week about how Americans are using fewer of their vacation days. Yes. Okay. So, so what is that about? Is it, is it that, oh, if I don't work harder than everybody in my office, I'm going to be the first one to be fired? Or is it, you know, some drive in me that says I need to be the hardest working person. So, you know, let me get the whip out and get going <laughs> on myself. I mean, I, I think that's there, but, you know, I, I think you're right that it's a cultural phenomenon that we don't encourage people to think and we don't encourage people to self-reflect. And these things, as you say, they can't be luxuries. They are absolute necessities, but they've gotten a bum rap. I mean, I think one of the things that's happened is that if if someone were to say to many people, oh, well, I think it's really important that I examine my life probably that's going to be met with a lot of, well, aren't you a little self-absorbed navel gazing twit or, (laughs) you know, Oh, aren't you all of that? Instead of saying that if, if, if I don't know who I am, if I don't have self-knowledge, 
in, in what sense am I prepared to meet the world at all? I'm really not all that prepared. And that, you know, there's something to be said for. There's no real hard, fast line between when I examine myself and when I examine my relationships. I mean, if you operate with a social conception of self, that in part who I am is the people with whom I'm in relationship and what kind of relationship. But I think there's just, like you said, there's no incentive for people to examine themselves. That, it's that unless it's internally generated or it's validated early on. But that's what's missing, like you said. But yes, exactly. If it is engendered early on, the incentive remains because they can see the long-term outcome of examining yourself. But if if we're coming from a traumatized space or a fearful space like part of it is just fear i'm afraid i'm not going to have enough money for my family or myself or my retirement or whatever i'm hearing in the news or whatever so i'm going to keep working 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 i can't take a break i can't take a break right and there's pressure from on high we need short-term quarterly stock dividends to our partners we need to show a good report we're not thinking about long term we're thinking in quarters right yep. And thus, it's the same that that trickle down from the boardroom. Even if we go, oh, those people, they're obsessed with money, they're toxic, blah blah. I don't want to hang out with them. The effects of their decisions, because of the power of having that much wealth and influence, is trickling down into businesses, is trickling down into the government, is trickling down into our schools because it's a value system. It may mm -hmm. not be stated plainly that our goal is profit and you need to learn how to live on your own. We're not going to guide your living at all. It's up to you or whatever it is, or the best, the one with the best toys wins or whatever those, but it, it may not be stated plainly, but the effects are clear. And so then there's two things going, there's more than two, but two things I'm seeing going on with that, which is first of all, hard to invest in these essential parts of personhood, which we're going to define and go over how we can do that. Uh, you really have to be countercultural to do this, right? Um, in a way, counterculture to the mainstream. Um, and secondly, um, I do think because of all these factors, we are having more stress. And with more stress, we know happens more mental illness. With more stress, there's more violence. With more stress, we know there's more alcohol, drugs, and things consumed. With more stress, we obviously know there's more psychopharmaceuticals consumed, which is fine. However, that's not the root cause, right? The, the root cause is the way our culture and society are is functioning from a base level of, of economics and uh, um, services all the way to how it's affecting people's nervous systems. And if the nervous system of a father or mother, whoever is, has a child, is completely in fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, or, or flop, right? If, if they're constantly scared for their future, that is passed mm -hmm. on to the children. Oh, epigenetics is real. Absolutely, right. positively, that you see those generational effects of trauma from one or two generations before. So, yes, we are we are in this absolutely terrible, terrible mess. And I think, you know, another contributing factor here is that with all the standardized testing with no child left behind and then mm -hmm. however that got remade with another terrible, misleading name. Um, that, you know, teachers aren't able to teach in the ways that they could before. And the metrics of evaluation are all about the test scores. They're not about the children. So oddly enough, test scores, I think, have displaced well-being and care of educating children to successful test scores and then to tie funding to how well a school does as a whole is utterly vicious because it penalizes the schools oftentimes that are the worst resourced, that have uh, the least amount of community capital and other things that are important to educating our children. And so, yes, here's this big, huge systemic problem and we can identify it. But, you know, the question always is, what do we what do we do about it? How do we how do we teach our our Children, how to imagine, you know, particularly so thinking about traumatized children probably have very active imaginations and probably are very good at imagining worst case scenarios because they've been living them. But not to be able to 
imagine positive outcomes, not to be able to imagine things being better, whatever that might look like. That being unable to imagine makes it far more difficult to hope well. So here's how these skills are a constellation, they're connected together. If I can't imagine good things happening to someone like me, you know, because I've been abused or because I'm the poor kid, because I'm the kid who is um, physically disabled in some kind of way. If I can't even imagine what something better might be, it becomes impossible for me to hope for it. I don't even know what to hope for. And hoping is something that can be done well or it can be done poorly. So there's this philosopher, um, Victoria McGeer, who talks about a distinction between wishful hoping and willful hoping. And they're both not good. So wishful hoping is a kind of magical realism. Oh, I wish that everything would suddenly be better. I wish I would get a pony or I wish I would win, you know, Powerball. And I never go and buy a ticket even. Sort of wishful hoping is all hope, but with no action to try to make a hope actual or to come true. That's wishful hoping. And it's a kind of escapism, which I can fully understand why some kids are going to be prone to that real wishful hoping. But it's not going to serve them well because those hopes probably will never be met. On the other hand, are the willful hopers. So those are the people who are going to make their hopes come true by trying to manage or manipulate reality, sort of that their very willfulness is going to make something come to pass, that if they just work hard enough, they can make something work out. And that oftentimes is destined to fail because my intentions and even my hard work may never be enough to guarantee the income the or the outcome that I'm hoping for. So how do you learn how to how to hope well? You know, to have some wishing and to understand you've got to have some willingness there, but it is kind of a, it's it's the sweet spot of hoping well. And then if you can't imagine, if you can't hope, it's hard to have empathy for others and for yourself because empathy oftentimes begins with my being able to put myself into someone else's shoes, my being able to mm. imagine what it's like to be them or imagine, well, how would that feel? And if I can't imagine, I don't have that kind of ability. It's hard for me to have any kind of empathy for others. And if I can't imagine myself being different ways and I can't hope for it, but I just think everything that happens to me probably is a consequence of my being a screw up or my failure, because those are many of the messages that people like me receive, then I'm, I'm not going to have much empathy for myself. I'm not going to have that kind of gentleness towards myself to be able to say, you know what, I'm doing pretty well, all things considered, or am, I'm amazed that I'm still upright, or I can keep going. So you don't have that empathy with another. And then and there's I, the, yeah, go I mean, ahead. Jump I, mean, I was going to say real quick, um, I love that you're going through this, but I was thinking about it from a tri uh, adverse child experiences kind of way. And from my clinical training, mm -hmm. when I, when I see, well, it's interesting when I see clients who've been traumatized as children, uh, there's many different ways this can manifest, but some two of the main ways I notice is they have trouble having empathy for others because they don't ever feel like anyone has empathized with them. They feel yep. so broken and hurt and so worthless that it's hard for them to have empathy for those. At the same time, the opposite occurs. I've also seen people that because of how much trauma they went through, they have almost very few boundaries and they have empathy for everyone almost to a fault where they're like a yes. walking victim. And they yes. walk into situation after situation after situation, wanting the best, but continually being victimized because it's the same pattern that they went through as a child. And then, of course, the third there's more, but th the third one just for kicks is they're just disconnected. They want to have empathy. They are aware of it, but they can't yep. feel it. Mm -hmm. And so they're dissociated. So then what do we do? One of the ways you feel close to people is usually... Uh, well, uh, you can feel closer and more emotions if you're drinking or using drugs or having sex with people, which may right. not be the best choice depending on what your situation is. Exactly right. And and I think 
those, those, those three options that you offer there, that they seem so contradictory to each other or inconsistent with one another, but they're really not. I mean, because they, they have that shared root, but it's just a different manifestation of not having that ability to feel with or into others or themselves. I mean, that they haven't learned how to do that. And because some people I'm afraid feel because I didn't learn how to do it, I'm incapable of doing it. So why even bother to try? I mean, I think that that dynamic pops up and it just becomes an easier story to tell myself, well, I'm just damaged. I'm, I'm just broken. This is how it's going to be. And so that then everything that happens in some ways is expected because that's what happens to people like me. Right. So that's a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes. Or the shutdown, um, yep. or the learned helplessness, which doesn't allow you not only to, it might block empathy, but I think it definitely blocks self possession and bodily dominion and the ability to hope for anything outside of what you're given. So, can you talk about the importance of your? I cut you off, sorry, but the other ones <laughs> you're about to go into some of the importance of what it is to have these other um, essential arts of person. So bodily dominion, I just think about the ways that trauma is inflicted through the body or in the body or by means of the body, and that many people who have been subject to some kind of physical abuse, sexual abuse, oftentimes will feel as if either they're not their bodies, they identify as their minds, they dissociate in that kind of way. Um, it's a very Cartesian dualism that I am my mind and not my body because my body is this terrible site of betrayal in a kind of way. People who haven't been traumatized or abused in general don't talk in terms of betrayal by their bodies, but a lot of abuse survivors talk about being betrayed by it. So to have bodily dominion is to have some authority over what happens with, to, or through your body. All the while recognizing that bodily dominion does depend upon how old you are and depends upon your physical capacity in some kind of ways. I particularly don't say bodily autonomy because many um, disability theorists have said, well, that implies a certain kind of um, able bodiness that, you know, some people who are physically handicapped in certain kinds of ways just can't physically do certain kinds of things. But dominion means to have control or authority over even if you have other people, say, if you need caretakers who are doing things for you, but it always requires your consent, your permission, that each of us gets to be an authority on his, her, their own body and what happens to it. So bodily dominion that way. And then self-possession is a term that I think about as being the exact opposite of being a people pleaser or belonging to the opinions of someone else. So self-possession is um, what? It's a way of having what Viktor Frankl calls responsibility. It's the ability to be able to respond and not just react. So earlier you had said, you know, fight, flight, or freeze are just reactions. But responsibility has a more deliberate, thoughtful dimension to it. So when Frankel was talking about, you know, what does it mean to have responsibility? So the ability to respond, he said that between a stimulus and a response, there's a space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. It is in our response that our growth and freedom reside. So what does it mean to not just react to how you think people want you to react, not just to go along with others, not just to always be in a position where you are constantly reacting because you're in a state of hypervigilance? That's to have self-possession. And I think Frankel is right. So Frankel was writing about being in Nazi death camps. So to talk about still to have responsibility, to have that moment between something happening and you're responding, 
that's where freedom is, even where you are subject to all different kinds of constraints. So to have that self-possession is to belong to yourself. Oh my goodness. I, I remember that passage so well, but mm. I I have not heard it explained in the way you just did, because it actually, from a trauma-informed kind of perspective about how the nervous system works, he was trying to have the ability to self-possess and respond instead of react in a Nazi concentration camp, yes, which is probably one of the most challenging places to have that. Um, I would assume based on, if you've read the book, uh, the man's search for meaning by Viktor Frankl, it's a very good book if you haven't read it out there. So I think about that. And I, I think that you're, this is a huge concept that needs to be explained to our culture because if my nervous system is constantly turned on, I, I said fight, flight, freeze, but what some of the therapists have been inserting onto, you know, the end of that is fawn, which is people pleasing, do anything to be accepted or yeah. flop, which is collapse. Like we call it burnout, right? I feel so tired and exhausted. Oh. I can't even function. So flop it's just cause it's an F, right? Thank you. We need it, more F words. We need more Fs. Um, but it's, you know, it's to, it's to collapse. It's our body's nervous system collapses. That's a, that's a phenomenon we see with catatonic, um, people, uh, that mm -hmm. was used to be a diagnosis a long time ago. Now we don't talk about catatonia as much. Um, but the, the fawn was interesting to me. Um, uh, all of them are interesting to me, but the idea that even let, let's just say any of the, any of those are activated. My nervous system is constantly activated. What's mm -hmm. going to happen is if you go, if you deconstruct that, it takes away some of my freedom because I'm no longer responding to what's going on around me. I'm reacting. I feel gross. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I don't feel good today. I, I need, uh, you know, I'm going to buy a very expensive coffee that I can't afford on my budget. Okay. Now I'm hungry because I forgot to eat. I'm going to quick go grab some sugar. I'm going to grab a donut that I shouldn't also be buying. Right. And then so, so on and so forth, uh, down the line, I start making these sort of reactive choices. And then I might start getting, I don't know, issues with my gut or issues with my weight or issues with that. And we see that carried out in the adverse child experiences study where children that had a higher adverse child experiences study have higher obesity. They have more likely to have it. cardiovascular issues and more likely to have drug addictions, uh, smoking, um, sexual transmitted diseases, all these sort of things. Why? Well, it started early. It started with the nervous system, not only the nervous system, but what is the message, which is more of where you're kind of coming from. What is this telling me? What are my rights as a person? What, what are my abilities as a person? And I feel like you're lost if you don't ever have the chance to repair. Now there's many ways to repair. It's not just therapy. There's learning, there's books, there's libraries, there's places mm -hmm. Uh, you, you know, there's public um, exercise classes that are available in most cities now through Meetup and different things like that. There are where, ways to work on repairing the nervous system. Relationships sometimes can repair the nervous system. If those people are in a healthy state, you can start mirroring that. But what if you don't have time or resources or education to get there? And I think about that with these poor kids out there and adults who are just sort of going through the motions, right? They don't even think that they're special. Another thing in America, if I'm not famous, I'm not special, right? We look at social media for for half an hour and you, you're, it was just, your brain will explode. But I think about this and, and, I'll, and I, keep, I keep coming back to time, which is not the point of this podcast, but I think about children and, and, and somebody once said to me, why do children always want attention? What is attention, right? I want attention from my mom and dad or my dad and dad or whoever it is. Attention is love. Because attention isn't requiring that you do the dishes necessarily. Attention isn't requiring that you do something for me. I'm giving you attention because you're a person and I want to show you love. And if you don't get that as a child and you're constantly, then constantly you can fall into that people pleaser role because oh, the yeah. only way I get attention is right. by pleasing others and helping others to my own detriment at times. So I was thinking about that as well and how this kind of plays oh, yeah. out. Oh, I, th I think that's absolutely right. So if, if you lack those essential arts, you're going to have a much harder time having a healthy self-respect. It, it's going to be in very short supply. And short self-respect, I mean, there, there are different dimensions of, of self-respect. I mean, I think there's 
what one philosopher calls rec- well, a couple do recognition self-respect that says it's respect for myself as a person. I matter because I'm a person. Just because I'm a person, I matter. And then there's evaluative self-respect. That means that I think I'm up to scratch. I'm up to snuff. You know, I'm, I'm good enough for something. And then there's basal or really basic self-respect, just that I matter, full stop. Not because I'm up to snuff, not because I'm a person, but just that I matter. And when these arts are hindered, it fundamentally impacts and makes much harder the ability for some people to have any kind of self-respect. And if a person has no self-respect, they're going to have very low, if any, expectations for themselves. They're going to have very low expectations for how they believe they should be treated well. In fact, it would probably be the opposite. Well, I just don't deserve any better because I just am a drunk or a drug addict or, you know, a sec, you know, pick whatever comes after that just, which oftentimes is a devalued category. And so here comes that self-fulfilling prophecy again. I'm never going to be able to stand up for myself because I really don't have a self. I do not have a fully formed self. And I'm not going to be able to say I deserve better because that I isn't well formed. And I might just be used to be treated as a thing or an object rather than a full person. So person is a moral category. It's a normative category that says things that belong to the person category have an innate dignity or innate worth that ought to be respected by others. Full stop. But if I don't even see that I'm a person, then I'm not going to think I'm entitled to those sorts of things. And that to me is utterly horrifying. When someone does not see him, her, or themselves as a person, it's, it's dehumanizing. I mean, so we can bring in all that kind of language of what is it like to be in the world where you're treated more as a thing or an object than as a person? Yeah, there's a whole range there. And I do think it's happening um, all around us uh, for many, again, many headwinds, many various factors that have caused us. But just take a worker in a store. They might feel happy when somebody talks to them and says, oh, thank you so much. and makes eye contact, right? Yes. But if people are in a hurry, even a well-meaning person might say, okay, thank you, bye. Or, um, you know, uh, if you go to a, I, I, at a coffee shop, I used to be a coffee shop worker some years ago. And I, I remember getting aggravated when people didn't even say hello. They would just say, mocha, double, whipped cream, bacon, donut. And they wouldn't even say anything. They wouldn't acknowledge my existence. And I was like, well, they really mm-hmm. should have robots working here because I can't deal with this. But I, I think about that when I, when I go to those places and I try to you know, have a nice conversation, not to interrupt their workflow, but just to kind of be human to them and be nice and acknowledge that they are existing and doing a service for me. And I'm, yes. I'm happy about it, but I, it's funny. But then I see the next person in line um, and they'll say, double latte now. And they'll just stand there. Like and they'll as just if, stand there, yeah. And, mm-hmm. and, I, and I mean, this goes both ways. I'm not blaming, I'm not demonizing the customer. I think I was thinking about the customer maybe not having social skills or maybe they are in a hurry and they're not thinking about the other people around them. They don't know, they don't live in that community. They're not invested in that coffee shop. They're not invested in that store. They don't think of Walmart as Joe's store or Sam Walton's store. They don't know who Sam Walton right. is, right? They just think of it as this is the place I get my food. I've got to get food. I've got to go home. I've got very little time, again, the time factor, but then also the nervous system, you know, and and thus, thus, they might be the nicest person ever if you get them at a party and you get them slowed down and thinking, but the person at the store is experienced, the worker is, God, people just don't even give it anything. They don't pay attention to me. What am I, worthless? That can go right into their psyche. Oh, easily, easily, Self-fulfilling prophecy. It is, and 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 I guess, you know, sure, there's the investment that this isn't Joe's Corner store and, you know, I don't have a tie to this community. But for me, it's about 
acknowledging, recognizing the humanity in another, regardless of what side of the counter I am on. It doesn't cost me anything to say, please. It doesn't cost me anything to say, thank you. If I'm having the worst day of my life, I don't know if that person is having their worst day of their life. What does it cost? But we don't notice it because, you know, the, the word that gets thrown around now is purely transactional. Everything is transactional. It's a this for that. We don't see each other as people or as persons anymore. It's like, oh, you're the guy who just takes the money. Or my pet peeve is being in a, a checkout line, you know, usually at the grocery store. And there's a person moving your food through and someone's on the phone all the time, doesn't even acknowledge. And I think not acknowledging is habitual. And I think it's a kind of laziness. I mean, I'm not saying everyone needs to be friends all the time and talk to everyone. I'm saying you need to acknowledge the humanity of another person. And where we sort of see the humanity of another is when we look into their eyes. We just had this wonderful conversation in one of my classes about when you're having really difficult discussions, it's important to be able to look someone, acknowledge that, look them in the eye, although not too long because then I can feel aggressive, you know, blah, 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 blah. But the idea that I am treating you as a person and that I want to respond to you well. So there's um, a philosopher, um, Peter Strawson, who talks about the different kinds of reactions and attitudes we have towards people. So human beings are capable of having and reading reactive attitudes. So we meet for the first time and you smile at me. I smile back mm. and I think, oh, well, you know, Paul seems like a nice guy and I'm going to act as if maybe Paul is a nice guy and, you know, maybe. And also, you know, we meet and you give me a dirty look. I'm going to respond to that like, well, Probably I would first think, oh, my God, what did I did wrong? Because, you know, I lean towards the people pleasing part. Um, or, you know, I might wonder, ooh, Paul's, Paul's got a kind of a stormy, stormy cloud above his head there. But that we respond and we interact with people. When we do that, Strawson says, we're in a participant stance with each other. That there's kind of a shared assumption that we both have reactions and that we will respond and we will understand and we will then go on participating with each other in this interaction. But with people who we, we mark as different or as other, and maybe some of these people who lack some of these essential arts, we other, to use a term from philosopher Simone de Beauvoir, or what Strassen says, we put them in the objective stance and we think, well, they don't take these reactions in the same kind of ways. And we start to interact with them as if they were not full-blown persons. And it becomes really easy and habitual to put certain people into the category of being in an objective relationship. And so I think we do that with these essential arts. So say you're interacting with someone and they have autism, so their social cues are different from what we expect. It's much easier to distance yourself from them and not fully interact in that participant stance with them. And I'm always worried that we as a culture have gotten far too good at putting certain groups of people into that um, objective stance. And that means we pull them out of the regular social traffic. We pull them out of social life, political life. We marginalize them and we disempower them. We don't treat them like full-blown persons to circle back around. Ah, and that's scary because yes. there's that often is a precursor to and when you disagree with somebody instead of having a disagreement in good faith, as in you're a citizen, I'm a citizen, we're both you know have our opinions, um, which I believe is uh, you know, treating them with you know the idea that they also have self possession. Yeah. Um, we, if we're losing an argument or if we're angry, we could, of course, work on demonizing the other party or othering the other party. And yeah. that is not too far from violence because, um, it, if you can put somebody into a group where they are not 
a person with the same feelings as you just because they have different opinions or physical traits or religion or sexuality it doesn't take long for anger to spread and activate among certain groups of people and yep. and and to look for a scapegoat or a whipping boy or of course you know the old the, the burning the witches which by the way i read extensively about recently and it was basically a holocaust of people that were different um yes in the middle ages uh, that had nothing to do with uh, black magic or anything um most of the time uh, so uh, essentially um you know that is a, a scary part because while humans have this incredible ability to love each other and to build each other up and to create communities and to to do so with with healthy boundaries right and and um working on creating a, a healthy community we also have this destructive power and if we're mm-hmm. not in our possession of ourself as a person and understanding like i talk about in some of my psychology uh, talks with my staff and others the sh- our own shadows are our, our, our difficult parts of ourselves where we may act out negatively on others or in our own personal life if we're not aware of that we can we can be gripped by anger or or, or, or something that causes us to cause great destruction, not only in our own mm-hmm. personal community, but possibly on the community of another group of people. And so, okay, we don't have too much time left, but as a moral <laughs> philosopher, how yeah. can we, how can people out there listening start working if they're like, ah, you know, geez, I was listening. I, I don't even know if I, I, only, I might have like one of these good traits of essential arts of personhood. How can they start gaining some of these traits back and sort of from your perspective as a professor? So me, I'm all about education, education, education. But for me, education is always about connection. Mm. It's connecting with other people or it's connecting through literature. So, you know, I came out as a young person. I was figuring it out in the early 80s. And so there weren't a lot of role models out. But me, I connected to literary figures. I read and I read and I read and I read. And partly that helped to fill my imagination of, look, here are who people who are like me, who have these deviant, wrong, sinful desires. I mean, all of that. I think there's also, to go back to something you said, that we don't make the time to think about ourselves in the world and to think about sort of who we are and how we're showing up and what are we hoping for life. What is it like to let ourselves carve out, even if it's five minutes of intentional time, of not looking at my phone all the time, of not just responding every time a notification goes off, to just kind of sit quietly, to say hello to myself, I think sometimes is is a radical act, you know, that to think that I have a self that could do that. I'm also a fan. I make lists about everything. I always have lists going and thinking about, you know, what would be times when I felt like I really did have bodily dominion or if I haven't felt like I've had it often. Well, why not? What was missing or what might I need to feel like I I am in charge over access to my body and what my body does and and that self-possession. I think that's. Maybe that's the, the crowning one altogether. It, it in, includes the other one. To think about what does it mean to, to belong to myself? What voices would I have to jettison? Or whose opinions have I made matter so much? Or what views do I hold about myself that I don't even know why I believe that about myself anymore? I just know that I do. So the philosopher Wittgenstein talks about making strange the familiar. In some ways, we're all very familiar to ourselves, to our habits. But what happens when we just stop and look at something, even for a brief moment, if we magnify it, when we amplify it? Oftentimes, we see things that we wouldn't have seen if we just kind of note it like, yeah. So for me, you know, outing myself here, continuing to be the people-pleasing person, I have become so much more aware of when and how and why I go into my people-pleasing mode. And it's been a great gift for me 
developed now over a good 15 years of the first time I interrupted it and said no to someone when they just assumed I would do something for them. I am like, oh, I want a banner. I want a ticker tape parade. So for me, it's important to when you do have these little moments of insight or these victories where finally you said no to somebody when you've always said yes, that you acknowledge and excel and, and celebrate them because they have to count for something. And, you know, to, to reach a point, you know, do I think that everyone has absolute self-possession? No, I don't. Do I think it's still a very important ideal to have? Yeah. And so to th- You know, to have even a brief pause between that stimulus and the response to try to stretch that gap bigger and bigger, I think, is one thing that's important to do. I love that. Um, I'll I'll do a little confession since we're on that topic uh, uh, before we we wrap here and then we'll uh, talk about how people can find out more about your work. But I um, uh, in my early career. I was vigilant about keeping time for reflection and creativity, very vigilant. And somewhere in the middle of my career, well, the middle, I'm still in the middle, but in the middle of my <laughs> Early current middle. phase, I, I had some opportunities. And so I took those opportunities on because I was excited. And also I wanted to help others and please others. And, um, I I soon found that I was doing work on the weekends and in the former spots where I had had these designated times where I would write or play music or read books or something, I was instead jumping on podcasts or audiobooks while driving and I wasn't sitting and I wasn't thinking and I was having less time to create music and less time to create uh, different things and, and to even think about what I was doing, my own behavior, right? Um, and you pay the price for that. And I, I would say this, uh, obviously, most of us learn by making mistakes. So you're going to make mistakes, you know, in this process of trying mm-hmm. to work on your center arts of personhood. But now I'm becoming more and more vigilant about putting that time back in my schedule, my personal schedule, my work schedule. And because the I've been to the other side and I've been to getting crispy like an air fryer and burnout, you know, and, and I realize mm-hmm. that you can't do everything, right? Um I mean, but you, whether I knew that intellectually, that's fine. I could pass a test, but I didn't know it personally. And I think the big, that's another point not to go off on that, but there's a point where learning is so important, so important because even in psychotherapy, a lot of, you know, a good third of what we might be doing or fourth of what we might be doing is called psychoeducation. We're just making people aware of things they weren't aware of to help them integrate that into their life or their story, Mm -hmm. right? That's a good little part of it. But, but if I can't, if I learn, 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 and I get obsessed with that, I've got to take time, at least a little bit of time, maybe, I don't know, a quarter of every time you learn something to think about how can I implement this idea and Mm -hmm. where, and what are the nitty gritty logistics of that? So I, I think I want to encourage people out there. It doesn't take much time, but it does take getting over the fear or the shame or whatever weirdness is of checking in with yourself and doing a journaling activity or or whatever it is. And for some people, it's therapy. For some people, it's attending a class, right? I reflect while I'm listening to a lecture. I don't know. So. All these things, but the key thing is being intentional about it. So it isn't necessarily the quantity of time, but it's the quality of the time when it's done with intention. And I think intentionality is something that more of us struggle with as we have more and more distractions. We've become far less intentional because so many things are now easier to do. So what does it mean to be more intentional about yourself? And when you do that, I think people will define find the time. And I would say this, if you're going to be intentional, you then have to figure out what's essential. And you'll find, and I think both of us have this story, that you have to cut out certain things, whether it be, you know, a distraction of some type or email or whatever. That's the hard part um, it, it, for some people is saying no. For other people, they don't have much going on. The hard part is I'm worth the time that it takes to be introspective and work on myself. 
rather than feeling the regret of I just spent seven hours in a row watching a series on Netflix that I never really liked, but it's so convenient that the play next episode, it just happens. And then I feel like crap. So. And and further was I, was I watching that because I was also lonely. There's that too. Right. And fear of, of being bored. We're terrified of being bored. And philosopher Bertrand Russell said, there's two types of boredom that there's, um, stultifying boredom that's just when oh my god i'm just i'm dying here with this boredom or he says there's fructifying boredom where that's actually in that quietness is where there's potential and where there's growth and if you tend that you cultivate your interest you're not going to be bored but sometimes you do need downtime sometimes you do need the netflix series but it's kind of moderation or doing things in a sustainable kind of balance, but we tend to be kind of all or nothing. Our our scales aren't very level. We tend to slam down on one side and then slam down on the other side. It's true. And so that that if we work on moderation, and this is kind of our last point here before I've got to send us off into the evening, but if we work on moderation, we will listen and, and I think slowly can balance those things. Like you said, mm-hmm. sometimes we need that Netflix. I, I thought about this a few weeks ago. I felt, I said, oh, my uh, my partner and I, we have this thing, green light, yellow light, red light. And ah. we'll say to each other, what light are you today? And I, I was like, I'm an orange, not red, <laughs> not yellow. And she said, uh, okay, well, you know what you need to do. You're an adult. And so then I planned the next day. I said, okay, I had all these things on my lists, my thousand lists. And I said, can't do that. I've got to, I, as much as it bothers me, I've mm-hmm. got to do something. And I actually, for the first time in months, watched a film and went on a bike ride and did all these things all day. And I felt wonderful. So by the time Monday morning came and I had moved my stuff and I woke up really early at like five in the morning and I did all my work until eight or nine o'clock. And it normally, if I had done that a normal day, I'd be very tired, but I had had this rejuvenation and I felt great the rest of the week just by thinking about intentionally, was it essential that I got all those things done on Saturday? No, it was a habit. Right. And so I, I, I'm calling myself out, but it's fun that it's fun to do this with you. So, um, kind of last point here. It, um, We've talked about some of the ways people can do this. Time is a big one. The Essential Arts of Personhood, you're kind of launching this sort of project. Uh, you have books out. Um, how can people find out about you? I'll, I'll put a link to your biography in the uh, in the show notes, but what, what, where should people start? Uh, one place to start is my website, which is pegoconnorauthor.com. Um, and there's links to books there. The most recent book is Higher and Friendly Powers. That's what we talked about uh, in the summer, I think it was. Um, But there's also, I write for Psychology Today. I've got a blog there called Philosophy Stirred, Not Shaken, which raises a lot of these questions about what does it mean to live in the world as a human being? What does it mean to live well? So that that website is probably the best landing page for me. And then people can go in a variety of directions on it. I love it. Peg, it is always wonderful speaking with you. Um, oh, right back at you, Paul. This has been great. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, yes, I will, I'm will. i going to put all that information there, and I'm excited for people to check it out. And I would just say, people, you can do this. It's simple. takes time and effort, but you can do it. Yep, I and I would echo that. You got this. And there you have it. This has been another episode of the Intentional Clinician Podcast. If you're enjoying the show, please share it with people you know. I would surely appreciate it. Or please give us a rating on iTunes. It really helps out a lot. If you are looking for an EMDR consultant for the International Association, I am now an EMDRIA consultant and can provide 20 hours needed to become EMDRIA certified. I have groups online and in person. Just check out my website, healthforlifegr.com, and send me a contact. 
If you're looking for EMDR training, I recommend EMDR Training Solutions. Check them out online. If you are in need of counseling, do not hesitate to make an appointment with the local counselor in your area. You can also make an appointment with the excellent clinicians in the Grand Rapids area at Health for Life Counseling and the Trauma-Informed Counseling Center of Grand Rapids by visiting www.healthforlifegr.com. If you would like to see one of them online, as long as you live in the state of Michigan, you can also do that, so feel free to contact us that way. The recording you just listened to consists of the personal opinions of Paul Krauss and his guest, and while these are based upon the literature they have read and their experience in the field, they should not be viewed as a definitive opinion on this or any subject. Listening to this podcast is not a substitute for treatment. If you're in crisis, please call 911 or the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 988. You can also text the hotline at 741741. If you've been listening to this show for a while, you'll know that I am all about preventing future violence in the United States. I started a nonprofit called the National Violence Prevention Hotline, which is a 501c3 organization. We are working to gain funding so that we can start a 24-7 hotline and chat line to reach potential perpetrators before they act violently. Also, it is going to correspond with people that don't know what to do with people in their lives that they fear may be violent. It is a bold effort to curb violence and save innocent lives by working to connect to potential offenders and people they know while they are in the planning stages of violence, help to de-escalate them, and provide resources so they can get appropriate professional help. The National Violence Prevention Hotline is looking to open up a conversation about violence in society, the causes, and the solutions. You can learn more by visiting our website at violencepreventionhotline.org. You can sign our petition, share with your network or even donate to the cause it's tax deductible did you know you can support your local bookstore by shopping at bookshop.org you can order online from the comfort of your own home while supporting local businesses near you if you are a therapist and you are not a member of your local counseling association i implore you to get involved if you're complaining about your job and the wages and the way things are with insurance You can't make an impact by complaining, but you certainly can make an impact by joining forces with other therapists. For instance, the American Counseling Association, the American Mental Health Counselors Association, of course, the National Association of Social Workers, and more. Get involved that way, and you can actually have a solution. All right. Until next time, I'm wishing you all a safe and peaceful week.